Hey everyone, this is Mac from Ari. In this video, we're going to cover the basics of rendering in VUA for Rhino so you can create a simple render in 10 minutes or less. We're going to recreate these two versions of a simple 3D scene. Once you know the tricks I use to get these images, you'll see that we can render these out pretty quickly. I call these cheat codes because they're really simple shortcuts that you can use to generate effective results. So let's get into the tricks that we can use. I'm breaking these down into five steps. One is output, or the size of the render that we're making. Two is view, or the framing and composition of the scene. Three is lighting, or how you choose to illuminate your scene. Four is settings, which put the camera and lighting in sync with each other. And lastly, five, materials, or the color, texture, tactile composition of the objects in your scene. So first, let's start with output. This refers to the size of the image you're making and is dependent on the aspect ratio, resolution, and final format. For example, if I'm rendering an image that is going to be printed on an eight and a half by 11 sheet, I would render this at 300 pixels per inch, making the render output 2550 by 3300 PPI. So let's set our aspect ratio to custom in the dropdown and input eight and a half by 11. That locks us in at our desired aspect ratio. And for now, we'll keep our image width and height under 1500 pixels since we're going to do some test renders. We'll only use the 2550 by 3300 settings for our final renders. Lastly, we'll go up to the renderer dropdown and set our image quality to low. This refers to the noise level in our image. And for our test images, it will render much faster if we have a high noise value, which is a low quality image. We'll change this back to high when we render our final versions. So now that we've set up our render output, let's move on to setting up our view. First, let's jump into our scene and make sure that we have an infinite plane or some sort of ground set up. Let's add an infinite plane to our scene by typing that into our command panel. Now that we have that plane set up, let's jump back into our V-Ray asset editor. Let's go back to settings, then render output. Here, we'll turn on save frame. The save frame preview is nice because it brackets off your render view so you aren't panning around the scene at random hoping to get a good shot. What you see is what you get. So we can pan around our scene in perspective until we land on a view that we like. Once we decide on this view, we will save this in our named views panel. Just type in named views into the command panel and it should appear. One thing to note about the save frame is that it only works in perspectival views. It does not work in an isometric or parallel projection view. For this tutorial, I will be rendering using an isometric view, so unfortunately the save frame does not work for this type of view. Okay, so we've landed on a view or two that we like. Let's see how those look before we add any light. We can't see anything, and that's because we haven't added our light source yet. So let's get into lighting, our next step. Let's jump to our V-Ray light panel, found here. In this panel, we have a number of lighting options. To stick to the title of this video and keep this simple, we're only going to cover V-Ray sunlight right here. So let's click that and place it in our scene. Now when we click the V-Ray sunlight option, this window appears. What this window allows us to do is set the sun to the exact time of day, year, and location on Earth. If you're creating a precise, realistic rendering, this is a great tool. But for the type of rendering I'm making for this tutorial, I don't care about this feature. Just click OK and then click anywhere in your scene to place the sun. Once the sun is placed, we can move it around to create the lighting direction that we want. Because my view is here and I want some light coming from the right, I'm going to place the sun to the right of my model and have it pointing diagonally at the objects. I'll move it up a little bit, give it a height that mimics a high afternoon sun and leave it there. Let's render it out and see how it looks. As we can see, the lighting is looking really strange here. Even when I open up global switches, found here on the bottom left of my render frame buffer, this doesn't seem to resolve the lighting. Typically, we use the global switches to fine tune our render and even avoid having to go into Photoshop after rendering. But our global switches can only do so much for us. We still need to make a few more adjustments to this lighting. So let's move on to the next step to fix this in our settings panel in the V-Ray Asset Editor. The first thing we need to do to adjust our render lighting is to turn on global illumination and then add an environment map. The reason our image is so flat is because global illumination is switched off, giving us this flat effect. So we'll go up to the renderer tab, click on this tiny arrow on the right side of the asset editor frame and turn on global illumination. 
Now let's open up the environment dropdown and set a sky map. We'll click on that blue square grid, which takes us to our environment map settings. From there, we'll need to choose a map from our defaults. I'm going to click on this button on the top left, and from there, scroll down to select sky. From there, we'll click back to return to our asset editor. Let's now render this and see how the scene has changed. Okay, looks like things are almost there. If I adjust the exposure and highlight burn values in my global switches, that makes things look better, meaning we have one more step. In our asset editor settings, Let's go to Camera dropdown. In Standard Camera Settings, we have an exposure value which is currently set to the default 10. This is much too low for our current lighting scheme. For a scene like this, with a high afternoon sun, we need an exposure value anywhere from 13 to 15. But for future reference, you may find yourself using an exposure value anywhere from 10 to 16. This just depends on the lighting scheme you've designed. One other thing to note is that for this tutorial, I'm only using the basic settings in Standard Camera, which limit us to controlling only exposure value and white balance. If you want more control, simply click to the right of standard camera. This button toggles between basic and advanced camera settings. Advanced settings give you more precision for your camera and are in-depth variables that control our exposure value. But for now, we'll stick to basic settings and only edit our exposure value. Let's see how our scene looks when we set this to 13 and render this out for another test. Looks like we're almost there, and let's move on to materials. We're at our last step, which is assigning and editing materials in our scene. Let's start with the pink render that we saw when we first began. To create this material, let's open the Materials tab in the Asset Editor, which is the button on the left. Now let's click on the bottom left button, Add Material, and select the Generic option. For creating custom materials, I prefer using this choice. Once we have our generic material in our editor, let's double click it and name it Pink. We can click on the right tab titled Quick Settings. These are quick adjustments we can make to a material without getting too in-depth. So in Quick Settings, all we need to do is change our diffuse color to a pink. So we'll double click on that box and select our desired pink. If you want to customize your material, like adding a specific texture, you can click on the grid and add a bitmap or preset map. But for now, we're going to stick with our generic pink. I'm going to assign this material to all the objects in my scene by selecting All Scene Geometry and then right-clicking the material and selecting Apply Material to Selection. Since my scene is one material, I can also use the Material Override tool in the Settings tab. If I turn this on and set the material to Pink, found in the drop-down, this will have the same effect as setting all the objects in the scene to this material. I'm going to render this out and see how it looks. All right, our pink scene is finished, so let's move on to our multicolor image. First, let's turn off Material Override. Now, to get to these varied textures and colors, I'm going to use a variety of V-Ray material presets. I'll get into material customization and editing in future tutorials, but for now, we're going to keep it short and simple and use our presets. We'll return to our Materials tab. From there, if we click on the tiny left arrow in the frame, we see a variety of materials in the library. I'm going to use gold, aluminum, glass, and wood materials from this library. To get these materials, all you have to do is find them in the library options, and then drag whichever option you like into your material editor. For gold, we go into the Metals folder, then choose whichever gold we like. I'll choose this one. And now I'll go through and select my aluminum, glass, and wood. I'm going to go through and assign these materials to different parts of the scene. I'll also create and assign a few more colorful materials to balance out the composition. Now we're all set. We'll do a quick render to make sure everything is all set before we render this out at full scale. All right, the settings for this are looking good. I'm now going to return to the settings to change the output to render this at full scale. I'll change the size and quality and we'll be set to render this out for final draft. Okay, so here's a look at our final renders. Hopefully this tutorial can help you crank out some quick diagrammatic renders for whatever you're doing, whether it's for a desk grit, pinup, a base for a collage, a final review, or whatever. And keep an eye out for our future tutorials where we'll go into more detail on materials, lighting, and more. Thanks for watching.